as a leader, it's always your responsibility, whether you are directly at fault or not. And I, I think that helps kind of create that team dynamic because, you know, I, I'm kind of, uh, kind of a, a wolf when it comes to people coming after, after my team. Um, it's like, you don't get to come after my team, but I can handle that with them directly. Hey Zach, how's it going? <laughs> hey Matt, it's going good. How about yourself? I'm doing great. So today I got a special treat. I've got an interview with CTO of Bovisync, Zach. At Lund. All right, Zach. Uh, so you've been working with me for some time. Um, we've worked together on two big projects. One for, I think I'm using their testimonial, so I'm, I think they're happy with me saying this, Enthusiast Enterprises, and uh, another one with Bovisync there, both large web applications uh, running on AWS. And uh, yeah, I wanted you on today to, one, talk about your experience working with me, but then to pick your brain on some of the experiences you have had as a CTO. So uh, I guess, do you want to give us some background on yourself before I go too deep into this? Absolutely. So Matt's been with me, you know, for, for a lot of my uh, professional experience going from being a, a developer up into IT leadership and eventually in these CTO roles. Um, early on in my experience at Enthusiast Enterprises, I was strictly a, a developer. And when our applications would go down, I would be pretty much waiting for an update from, from Matt on, you know, what the estimated timeline would be for our applications coming back online. And that was, was never a fun situation to be in when, you know, you have a, a big team around you that is looking at you as the IT guy to figure out, you know, when your applications are going to come back online, but you have no idea. And, and working with Matt over the years, I think one of the coolest things is he helps teach you and, and grow you and your team to also understand your infrastructure and, and how your web applications are hosted so that you can do more and more troubleshooting on your own. Or even if, you know, Matt is still doing some of that work on the back end, you can give a lot more, you know, intelligent updates as to what the problems are and, and what's the, what the resolution is and how far we are out from that. All right. Well, thank you. That's, uh, <laughs> I meant more to focus on your background, but thank you very much there. Um, I'll be honest, the, the on-call stuff, I, I try and train people up mainly because I don't want to be on call. <laughs> you know, 3 a.m. bump in the night, uh, it's a young man's game. Let me sleep in. So I'm very big on, on training people there. So, yeah, you want to tell us, I guess, a bit more about your, your journey to becoming a CTO and how that all happened? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think a lot of it was... You know, I, I started, you know, in, with Enthusiast Enterprises at the time. It was Custom Offsets as the, the 10th employee and first developer, you know, outside of the, the co-founder who built the original websites. And I, you know, didn't come from uh, a family where, you know, there was a lot of like business executives or people in, in leadership positions. And I just, you know, I was the youngest of three brothers. and never saw myself as a leader. I, I thought that uh, leaders were born, not made. And that, you know, it was, it was my job to just, you know, do the tasks ahead of me and that I was always going to, you know, report to other people and not necessarily be leading a team on my own. And through that experience at, you know, at Custom Offsets and some of the, the great founders there, I think they, they saw something in me that they decided to double down and really, really push me on. And I just continued growing and, and learning. And I've got a, a deep passion about for people and, and making sure that not only is the organization reaching their goals, but that the, the team members are also reaching their goals and getting to where they want to be in life. And I think that's where IT leadership has allowed me to both, you know, empower people well building solutions for the company to help the company grow and i get a lot of uh a lot of enjoyment out of that so yeah it's one thing that you do that's fairly masterful and definitely something that ee did really well is create like a, an environment where the team wants to be there you know the uh the social outlet i, I miss I, I was just listening to a podcast recently where this is like the number one indicator of 
of, you know, people's job satisfaction isn't like money or anything like that. It's how many friends you have at the company. And you've done an interesting job taking that culture that you helped create there. I mean, being as, you know, the first hire pretty much on the tech side um, and then scaling that up and then bringing it to this new company and then putting that together. How, what's your, what's your secret? What's your philosophy there? I think the, the biggest thing I've learned is if you're teaching people and you feel that they aren't learning or you're inviting people out to events and they're not coming, it's not as much that they don't want to be there. It's that, you know, you need to look within on what about your approach do people not enjoy um, or, or do people not want to associate with. So for me, just really focusing on within on like, how are you providing value to other people? How are you creating a fun experience or, or, or creating that, that strong team? And then uh, a big one is also being willing to show, you know, humility and admit faults first. So um, when things go wrong, you can commonly, you know, try to point fingers at one person and say, you didn't do your job. And this is why this problem happened. But as a leader, it's always, your responsibility whether you are directly at fault or not and i I think that helps kind of create that team dynamic because you know i'm kind of uh kind of a a wolf when it comes to people coming after after my team um it's like you don't get to come after my team but i can handle that with them directly yeah i've seen you do that firsthand it's uh, really well done i think it means something to the team members that I've worked with that have had you kind of say, okay, I'll take fault for this one and then I'll correct the situation. And I think it's been appreciated from what I can tell. So, uh, and I mean, from what I see, your guys right currently are pretty dang loyal. So, um, so how do you, I mean, some of these guys, you, you were there when you came here to this new thing. Um, when you, when you brought me in, my job was to help build something, but also to train up your guys so they could maintain it and pass that off. And I know we've talked about this before, like, um, hiring and recruiting for this, this type of positions, how do you select your team or how do you recruit them? How do you put them together? I mean, how do you, how do you decide who works on what? Cause you assigned me the best guy for the job, as far as I can tell from your entire team. It was just the most interested. So I don't know how, how, how do you make those decisions? A lot of it comes down to personality and how the people fit in the team is probably what I care about the most. Um, if, if I have people that I, I can't have a conversation with a comfortable conversation and, and there's just a, an uneasiness or a distrustfulness there, um, I, I heard an example, I guess I'll go back. So I went to a, a conference, you know, I don't know, it was probably seven, eight years ago now. And it was uh, one of the speaking events was on culture within companies. It was, it was, I think it was one of the executives from like Chase or one of these really big financial institu- institutions. And they used this example. They said, you know, your team is like a bowl of ice cream. If you had, you know, a little speck of uh, manure poop in your ice cream, would you still eat it? And most people in the room are like, no, I'm not eating, eating poop in my ice cream. And that's the the same scenario with the team. If you have, if you have one person on the team that is not a good fit, um, that can happen through them making the rest of the team unwilling to talk and speak their opinion because they think they're going to get shot down. Um, so it can really kill collaboration. It can kill happiness, positivity. So I, I really, if I do recognize a, a issue with a specific person on the team, I try to act fast and remove that. Um, there was one scenario where we were having morning standups and I was getting really frustrated that nobody wanted to give updates on to where their projects were at morning standups. And when I removed this one person away from the team, it was not apparent. It took me months to recognize it. And when I removed them from the team, communication and collaboration changed immediately. So I think it's really important to, to pay attention to, you know, are, are people shutting, shutting each other down or, or making people not feel valued? I'm going to jump around to a, a bit of a self-serving question, but uh, with my consulting stuff, 
they they tell us to try and ask the clients why me, why specifically me. And ideally, I, I pick my clients based on how much value I can add to them. But I'm going to ask you, uh, why did you why did you go so, so, uh, come find me after you left EE for the Bovisync project? Absolutely. Um, I've worked with different uh, consultants over over the time, and I think part of it is is comfort. So you know, through our experience at EE, we went from having one to two day occasional downtime experiences early on, let's say year one of my career there. And by year three and all of the um, systems you helped us implement, our downtimes were minimal to non-existent. And if we did have issues, it was code problems going to production, breaking things, or in uh, a worldwide AWS outage where one of the the partners we integrate with for an API went down that interfered our, our checkout system being able to work. Um, and besides that, it's the coaching and mentoring. So you come alongside and meet the, the company where they need you. If they need help advocating technological needs to the executive team, to the C-suite, you meet the the company where they're at with what they need out of a consultant. So um, in the past, you've helped me ad advocate uh, why we might need to migrate to some new technology or fix a certain piece of tech debt or, you know, ad address the problem, helping me turn that into a, a good presentation that I can share with other executives to get buying in the organization all the way down to training frontline developers that want to get more into the infrastructure, AWS, Terraform space, learning, you know, how systems work. Um, and then at the end of the day, I know if shit ever hits the fan, you'll be there and you'll be right alongside of us working until the, the problem's fixed. Yeah, we've been through, I've tempted to bring up the one, uh, you know what, I'll save it for the end. Yeah, you're smiling because you know what story I want to bring up. We'll save that for the end. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Uh, that's that, I appreciate that. I think one of the things that impresses me about you is your focus on data. Before I dive too much into that, one of the things I do when I come on is I try and figure out, you know, they might say, oh, this is a, the, you're here to fix X, Y, or Z. But, you know, you got to ask the why to, to basically get back to, well, it's hurting our bottom line. You know, and maybe it's a, a person problem, in which case you're more suited to fix that problem. You know, but if it's a technical problem, you know, I'm not I'm not just there to migrate you to technology A, B or C. I'm here to help improve the overall bottom line health of the company and, and ensure you guys are you know profitable. I mean, it's, I'm assuming it's in a moral way, but I've never had that problem. You know, I haven't worked for cartels or anything like that. Um, but uh, yeah, so you're, you're I've, got a, I've got a business idea for you to talk about later. OK. <laughs> 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 Sounds litigious. No I'm kidding. Um, you're very data driven, and I've seen you. You know, you're fairly technical as well, but you also know when to step back and let other people um, kind of handle it. But then you also, it's like trust but verify. You go back and you pull up the data. I mean, we just spent you know how many weeks getting that new dashboard and X-ray implemented and all that. You want to talk about how data influences your decisions or how you use that to run your company? Absolutely. Um, if you don't have data, you are most likely just talking about opinions and everyone has varying point of a, points of opinions. Um, and then there's also varying qualities of data. So just because you share data doesn't mean that's real or accurate data. So um, everything from managing P&Ls, you know, all the bills that come in, that's a pretty easy data point to to manage. If you don't have the money to pay the bill, you probably shouldn't be spending the money down to, um, let's say you have a, a issue with page load speed on a part of your application. It might be on the front end. It might be on the back end of the application. You really won't know that until you can unfold the data and, and see, you know, which parts taking the most time. And then you can use that to just continue narrowing down and find out where the real problem is. Yeah, and I've seen you use that. Like, technically, it's with third-party contractors to really to hold their feet to the fire when they say, "Oh, it's not this thing; it's that thing." And then you're like, "All right, show me the data," and and you've got data saying it is this thing. 
Um, and that's, I, I just, it's, I've seen you do it really well. And I think that works to get, we work together well on that one. Cause I'm very much a data driven person as far as figuring out how to connect the dots there. One thing that I am openly weak about is project management. One thing that you do well is implement processes and procedures that allow you to manage the team better, even better yet. As you recently told me, you've got someone else handling a lot of the day-to-day priorities and prioritization of what the team should be working on. And those are all based on processes I believe you brought in and implemented. Uh, You want to talk about your use of processes or probably maybe like list off a couple of the most processes you find the most valuable? Absolutely. I think top of mind is Agile and Scrum. Um, Using that within a development team has been been tremendous for being able to just understand what is the team's capacity and what can they achieve. And if you're given a huge list of tasks to get done, you can easily just sit there and stress about how much work you have to do, or you can go starting on the work. So, um, you know, using that backlog to list out all your work then once you're running sprints under scrum you can figure out how many points of work your your team can achieve in a in a sprint then you can start forecasting out you know in ahead how much you know how much time it's going to take to complete certain initiatives so that's been super beneficial to have a framework like that that the entire team understands and can be aligned around besides that i guess i i've got different opinions on on processes you know some some have to be followed like you have to review your code in staging before it goes to production but then some projects might require testing with a slimmed down local database some projects might require testing through a full size development database and giving the team uh the ability to make that decision and talk about you know how should we go through building this project and testing it gives them that freedom where you don't pile up so much red tape that people can't breathe yeah uh, makes makes sense there i want one thing i want to jump back to is um kind of how you guys split down tasks and just say all right let's get working on it one thing we've done together is we've worked really hard to find the risky portions and get that, let's do a proof of concept first before just sending it on a big task there. Uh, I, I'm huge on that. That's another project I did. They were building a mobile app and they spent millions of dollars on this thing. And the most important feature was that they needed to make it work in offline mode. And so it had to be able to sync back up with the server when it came back online, um, which is something you guys are dealing with too, but I didn't yeah. write that app. Um, but we, the, the, the company they originally hired to do it, did save the offline mode for last. They did all the easy stuff first and then couldn't crack the offline mode. So uh, then I came in and that was the, the thing that I just focused on until we got it. And then the rest of it was easy. So with you guys, we've done things similar with infrastructure and things of that nature. I guess my question is, uh, how do you, what are ways you use to mitigate risk um, to, inside your team when, you know, figure out the, the where the bombshells are, where the landmines are, where the landmines are. Absolutely. I mean, I would start by saying I'm not perfect at it. So, you know, we we still hit landmines, you know, occasionally. I think it's it's good to admit that. Um, but one thing I I have gotten a little bit more out of t- touch with my day-to-day coding and development experience, but my foundation there, I still think about things very logically. So, if if I'm going to manage you know, a website and a development team of a website, I want to be able to go to a whiteboard and say, when a user goes to this website or this URL address, I can white map whiteboard, you know, where that traffic goes all through the different systems within AWS down to the code, back to the database, back to the code, to then displaying content to a user. And having that that logical mindset, I think, really helps you think through problems and software you're building to be able to bring up those potential areas. That combined with flowcharting um, processes. So, 
typically if we're going into a project that we haven't done before and we've got a lot of unknowns we just start and i use visio but you know you can use any any flow charting tool and start building out that process you don't have to build a perfect flow chart as long as you're logically saying you know here's the end result you're trying to achieve we want to you know have have five cars going down the highway and then you have to start and you say, all right, where are your five cars? Well, the five cars are in the garage. All right, what do we need to do? Well, we need to get keys off the wall. You got to get in the vehicle. You got to open the garage door, start the key or start the vehicle and make all the turns to get on the highway. So once, once you can get the team logically thinking through all those steps, it starts to expose a lot of those problem areas or the you come to a question that you just don't have an answer for and you know you need to spend more time on it. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. That's interesting. We've talked about how we train that for people. You asked me, you said, how do you train that logical mindset into that? And I've been doing a lot of thinking on it. And actually, one of the things that I've been doing with a different client that we should talk about, too, is I've been doing war gaming, where I set up an infrastructure in a sandbox environment, like your staging environment. And we block out, you know, X amount of hours. And I come in and I knock over pieces of the infrastructure and they have to put it back up. Um, it's actually kind of funny because I, I, years ago, I created a kind of a whiteboard game, my version of Dungeons and Dragons, where I would draw up a network map on the board and then I would have cards from all the horrible times that something went sideways. And I'm pretty sure the one we're going to talk about at the end there is on one of those cards. Um, cause that was a compounding nightmare there. But, uh, so it's war gaming, you know, and I think that might be a valuable training method. Um, that I'm actually thinking about offering as a uh, as a productized service in my consulting. So, just a random note there. If you wanted to be one of the guys to try it first, uh, you know, that'd be a fun. Might be a fun thing if, if if you know, it'd be great if I was allowed to record it. But we can negotiate that later. So, absolutely, that does that does sound like a cool cool experience. Yeah, good good. Um, I could see I could see one of your team members really enjoying it. I can see some of the other ones. Yeah, maybe it'll get them a little less stressed on it because it's a fun way, you know. It's nothing that can really. Yeah. So, um, just restart restart the database, and that'll fix it. <laughs> All right, we don't need to get too into the weeds here. Um, so, what important lessons? Yeah, I, I got. Uh, I'm going to call these a fire questions or fire round questions. I'm going to fire at you rapid fire. What important lessons have you learned as a CTO? Let's just go in the last year. What's the most important thing you've learned in the last year? And feel free to say two or three things. <laughs> the result, the result of the work that gets produced is equal to the effort you put into casting that vision in a way that the team understands. So I, I think it's really important to understand different people's learning styles and have the self awareness that you might not be communicating a project as well as you think you are just because you understand it yourself doesn't mean when you talk about it to your team that they're going to understand it so that's that's something that's been you know really big on my mind is you know show me don't tell me let's let's make sure that we're doing all we can to equip the team with the vision you have if it's very important that the vision in your mind is what gets executed um let's see here besides that i can vouch for it what you're thinking of the next one the your visio communications and all that um i think we've worked really well together because you know i'm a big diagrammer um network maps swim lane flow maps all that stuff to help communicate um the, the details of things but your your diagrams help communicate like a lot of the bigger picture stuff and it's nice to kind of have that you know you throw it throw that off to one of us we you know diagram it up figure out how it's all going to work together and then the team all gets on the same page so that's been useful um definitely in the past awesome um got the next one might have might have been failing on my active listening there as i was trying to think of the next one sorry i was buying um, time <laughs> yeah so i have been doing you know trying to focus on different areas of self-learning between entrepreneurialism um leadership development and then also marketing because i i enjoy understanding customers and and how to talk to them so one of the books i listened to is the seven habits of highly effective people and when i first started listening to books 
I thought that I needed to be getting in something insightful every chapter. And what I learned is if I find one, th one thing that's insightful that I can take away and apply to my life that, you know, impacts me for the rest of my life, that book was worth it. So in the seven habits of highly effective people, they talk about creating weekly plans versus daily plans. And I started doing that um, at Monday or Sunday afternoon. I do it for my, my work life, my personal life. I literally have it, have it sectioned out by um, work personal, which is like, you know, cleaning the bathrooms, whatever your household duties are that you need to get done that week. Um, then also as a husband, you know, what should I be doing for my wife? And then for the hustle outside of work and all that, what do I want to be doing to continue to improve my life? And that has really helped me focus on more meaningful, impactful work than the urgent highly prioritized or procrastinated tasks that are sitting in front of you. So making those weekly plans has just helped me, you know, not look at the six month bigger picture, but look at that week's bigger picture. Nice. I got it. That, that's admirable. I, I feel like I try and then I always derail myself. So um, if you can stick to it, that's, that's impressive. All right. Next rapid fire question. What are your biggest challenges coming up? And you can save the details, broad strokes as, as a CTO in this industry. What are your, what are your biggest challenges coming up? Uh, hiring has been a challenge. So um, I recently have been hiring a couple new engineers and I'm pretty frustrated with the impact AI has had on that. I had an engineering position that I had to review over 250 applicants just through Indeed. And um Tons of the resumes, you know, I, I asked for seven years of experience. Almost every resume I looked at had seven years of experience, which tells me there's some sort of bot where they're just applying, you know, if they're meeting basic requirements. Um, and like, I'm not looking for much to, to have a phone interview. I want someone to, to have a, a resume that looks like they have the talent needed to fill the job. And then I'll send out a message and say, hey, please reread the resume or, or excuse me, the job description if you didn't submit a cover letter and tell me why you'd be a good fit for the job. Only half of the people. So I narrowed 240 resumes down to 40 people that I sent this message out to. The 40 people then got narrowed down to 16 that even responded to the message. Of the 16 that responded, most of them said, regurgitated that they looked at the job description and thought they'd be a good fit, but said nothing unique about, you know, the company or, or anything besides just that they believe their resume matches the job description. Um, so if you are looking for a job, put the effort out to, to try to connect with the hiring manager, um, to just be personal and share something from your heart because, if you, at least if you're talking to me, I'm going to value that. Um, but that was, that was very frustrating. I did end up finding a great candidate and we're really excited to have him join the team, but that was a, an incredible amount of work. And I was ready to just give up and say, let recruiters deal with this. I'm glad you found him and I'm eager to meet him. I haven't made it, met him yet, but uh, I'd be, that'd be good. That kind of leads us to something right now. I was going to say, what what are the trends you're seeing in this in our tech industry? What what's something? I mean, obviously AI is in there, but are you seeing anything else coming up that uh, people should be aware of? People should be researching. People in the technical, these CTOs, technical managers, etc. Obviously, AI is big from a from a buzzword perspective. Um, I I I think there's there's CTOs that feel like they should be doing this futuristic, super exciting, super fun sounding work. And then there's probably the majority of people that their job is to continue improving their application, keeping the lights on and mitigating cyber risk and cyber attacks and breaches and all that. Um, so I would say my focus is really you know, continuing to improve the platform and and grow the team, grow everyone's skill sets, grow my own skill set. But you know, we aren't we aren't doing a lot with with AI and super futuristic technologies. We're just 
continuing to to modernize our application and, and build on it. Well, AI, I mean, you, you can put it everywhere, but should you put it everywhere? You know, you guys have a pretty grassroots customer base. Literally, they raise animals that eat grass. So uh, I got a little pun in there. But yeah, it make, makes sense to focus on your customers' needs instead of the bells and whistles there. And I think, as far as I can tell, you do it very well. I don't talk to your customers directly, really, except that one meeting you pulled me in and gave me no context. Yeah. It turns out they didn't speak English. So, <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah. That's what, Matt, that's what Matt's good for. Throw them in the fire. Yeah. Uh, we, we figured it out. Once I figured out what we were trying to do there, I thought we were trying to yep. hire them for a minute, but they were customers. <laughs> um, all right. Last fire round question here. What is, do you have any advice for CTOs or other technical managers that are trying to run a tech company? What's, what's an important thing you wish you knew when you first started this? You don't have to be the expert. And the moment you accept that and even communicate it out to the team, I think it it removes a lot of the mystical characteristics of, of what a CTO is supposed to do. I, I don't view myself as an expert in technology. I view myself as a, uh, someone that understands technology, but tries to bring out the best, hire the best team that works the best together and, you know, brings experts like yourself to come in and, and mentor gaps when you have them. Um, I also really like to focus on the customer's needs and understanding the customer's needs. I don't want to just know the technical things we need to do, but I want to know why we're doing them and who we're going to impact so we can do uh, a better job with that. Absolutely. That's great advice. That's great advice. You know, to, and, and you are extremely humble. You're, 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 you're technical, more technical than some of my clients. Um, and you're extremely humble about that, but you're, you're very honest when you don't know something, which makes it easier to, that makes it easier to communicate. It's like, okay, I'm not talking over your head and we can start here and, and you know how deep to get into it, which is very refreshing to have a, a client that's like, okay, I've got enough to make a decision on. I know what the metrics are that we need to watch. I know how much it's going to cost us roughly, or at least a formula to estimate that, you know, all right, let's, let's either go or no go. So, uh, it's always been um good you know to, to work with you on that one so all right well that's most of what i had um thank you for jumping on i guess do we do we want to end with the 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 catastrophe story or or uh we can just well I'll, let me let me give give my pitch for you a little bit here so i i've been working with matt somewhere around seven years i think seven to eight years and and I've watched, you know, I think I've watched Matt grow a lot as Matt's also watched me grow on, on the other side of the, of the spectrum. And I think why I would, would recommend Matt, you know, the, the first risk I would say is you are a, you are a one person team right now, right? Yep. So I think that would be a concern. A lot of people would have It'd be like, it's only one guy, you know, what happens if, if Matt gets hit by a bus, but I've seen, you know, in my last position, you come in and train our team independent to the point where we really don't need you. And we bring you in for advice. And then the same thing with this new company, um, brought you in, let's see here, July of last year, officially June, July was probably the official, like bringing you in. And we didn't start our real big server migration project until um, August. And when it came to actually going live with that project in November, my team was able to do, you know, the brunt of the actual work with, with you advising the actual production cutover. We had literally no impact. Our customers didn't even know what we switched our servers, which I tell people is a, a live heart transplant and and since then we've had some other projects we've wanted to do but because of changes in the priorities of the business we put them on hold and you know we haven't had 
had issues with with downtime our servers auto scale i mean for more information uh matt helped us take some completely out of date terraform code that was useless could not be used to to build on and set up our our new terraform uh code within ecs got all of our applications cut over learned our business which is pretty complicated in my opinion to, to make that happen. So um, his ability to learn that in a short amount of time, research the numbers, forecast the costs. I mean, uh, when you were forecasting what you thought our servers were gonna cost in the new environment, you were pretty dead on accurate to what it ended up costing um, in the end. So, you know, Matt will meet you where you are if you want a, a coach in your ear as an executive and you want some help with technical direction and be able to make better technical decisions he'll do that if you need you know your team to be built up and mentored he'll do that um i don't want to speak on on your behalf but i don't think your goal is to manage a bunch of companies infrastructures personally you want to mentor a lot of companies teams to be self-sufficient and and I think that's what makes you a great partner. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I literally am trying to work myself out of a job. I come in and I'm the more technical side. And if I have to, you know, build it, I'm like, give me someone to build it with, you know, so I can train them. And uh, yeah, I basically try and work myself out of a job and make sure that your team's trained. Also, if they're trained, then I don't have to wake up at 3 a.m. if the servers go down. So, you know. And yeah. you successfully did that. I mean, we're paying you peanuts now at Bovisync to what we were eight months ago. So congratulations. <laughs> No, it's, uh, it's all right. I'm on, I'm on to the next one. <laughs> so, yep. all right. Well, thank you so much for that glowing you know, testimonial. Also, I, I, I should say, I, I very much enjoyed working with Zach. I can tell you this. He's, we can go back to the story. He's come a long way and I'm very impressed with what he's doing right now. You know, selecting the team. He knows the people side. He knows how to manage them. Like it's not just about the ones and zeros and you can hire an engineer to be a CTO, but that's not the, the always the right decision, especially at the size of company you're at right now, you need someone that's focused on, you know, growing the team, you know, putting the right people in front of the problems, you know, making sure that your team is feels appreciated and is protected from, you know, other politics in the office, we'll say. And, uh, you know, you also, like I said, very much focused on the dollars and cents, not just the ones and zeros. It's, uh, the engineers curse a lot of engineers, you know, fall in love. Oh, I love this technology. Does it matter? Is it going to actually fix the problem well then so hire hire him except he's already got a job but if he starts looking someday <laughs> um okay. all right so let's close on the story do you want to kick it off you remember that story yeah so this would have been valentine's day 2018 Something like i believe that. yeah so that was what february 12th 2018 is that valentine's day or is it february 14th Whatever day it lands on. It feels like 2019, but either way, it doesn't matter. Somewhere. No, somewhere back in there. And I remember how this day started because my wife was working a job where she had to be to work at 4.30 in the morning. So I was like, if you're going to get up this early, I'm going to get up this early and go to work too and you know, be able to end my day that much sooner. So I got to the office at 5 a.m., 5.30 in the morning, something like that. Started working. I don't remember the first problem that happened, but I know somewhere around 5.30, 5.45, like I was only at my desk 15 minutes and things started falling apart. We, we, we knew we were going to switch to Docker that day to ECS from, uh, I think it was OpsWorks. We had you on before that. And so we, they decided they had this other consultant come in who knew PHP really well. They didn't know Amazon or anything like that. And he sold you guys on FPM. Um, which yeah. is uh, a module to run. I had, no, I had no idea what it meant, but it sounded great. Yeah. Well, and so he got it to work uh, locally on in a Docker container on their machine. It got it to work on the developer's machines, got it to work on staging. Um, and I, I wasn't a fan of it. I wanted to stick with the same stack, but we said we'll rip the Band-Aid off for both. And I agreed, so I'm taking responsibility for it. And when we got it to production it couldn't handle the load. And so I, I tried passing it back to the FPM guy, like check it out. And he's, you know, so we went back and forth on that a bit. And then somewhere throughout the day, and I don't know where this 
I, I blame I blame everybody. I blame myself. But <laughs> somewhere we got the idea to rip out the last of the WordPress code in the code base, which was a significant enough change. And I, we had been at this all day because with FPM, we're like, do we roll back? What do we do? And we kept trying it. And finally, at some point, I think you ran in there, yelled Leroy Jenkins and pushed the WordPress code straight into production, which is another Yay. big change. And, and then I said, I, cause I had been, I hadn't showered yet. I had been on that deploy all day and I think it was like 4 PM. And I was like, and I'm going to go take a shower. I was, uh, I was none too happy about that. Cause I was strategically very precisely testing things. So after the shower, then I hop back on and eventually we, we came to the conclusion by just, going really deep into the FPM stuff that it was indeed the FPM and that a settings file for the memory pool of how many processes can fork was not configured right. And I just, I started throwing stuff at the wall and sure enough, it's probably the same configuration we're using today once we figured out what it was. So, but yeah, there was a minute there. What I, I remember the, I was none too happy with you there. Feel free to just add any color from it. your side. Just going to send it. Yeah. Oh, if you Leroy Jenkins did, I was like, ah, been too imprecise debugging all day and all we got a whole new set of things. I was like, yeah, but you guys, we pulled it off. It just was a 16 hour or so day. <laughs> it's amazing how much clarity we've gotten or I, I have gotten, I guess I should say since, you know, since that time, because I was still learning about how AWS infrastructure even, even worked to be able to ask the right questions to point to you know, where the problems were. And, and for the record, I was not the CTO at that time. Um, if, if anything, I was a team lead. But um, with, <laughs> with that, one of our engineers, we gave him a really hard time because he was the one most interested in, in DevOps and in AWS and all that. And he had really struggled to get a girlfriend. And this was Valentine's Day, so we gave him a really hard time that uh, that that he took the sites down just so just so we had companionship all day long. But he's actually married now, so congratulations to him. He's he solved that problem. Nice. But uh, he won't have to take anyone's infrastructure down on Valentine's Day again. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. But since then, you've been very strategic in your in your deployments and everything like that. I, uh, you you very much know the the cost of downtime and and respected but cool well i think we should wrap it up people you can find me at schematical.com or schematicalconsulting.com if you want to engage my services uh i've got all sorts of free stuff on there find me subscribe on youtube zach where can people find you you can find me on on linkedin zach edland uh if you want to find the not professional me you can find me on youtube at captain zach fishing uh, I've got a YouTube channel I run there all around picking night crawlers, night crawler farms, fishing, cooking, uh, not tech related at all, but I have fun with it. That recipe you had the other day looked good. That looked good. The, uh, the salmon bowls. I think. Yeah. 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 Okay. That, that, that was, that was very, very, very good. Nice. Well, thank you for joining me. I'll uh, see you later. Thanks, Matt. Have a good one.